Hi, everybody. Hi, Lisa. How are you? Hi, Gav. I'm great. I'm excited about this episode. Me too. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in today. Today, we have an inc another incredible guest with us. Her name is Natalie Reed. Uh, she is an unbelievable dancer. She's she's had also an amazing career, and she is a rocket. She's been a rocket for the past how many years? I was, I want to say twelve years now. I've done the show, the Christmas Spectacular, for nine seasons. Nine. Um, yeah, so nine, nine, nine years of uh, the Christmas show. Yeah, that's awesome. Have you always wanted to be a rocket? <laughs> was that like always your dream? You know, I was always told just when I was younger, I was quite tall. And so I was told, oh, one day, like, you should really look into the Rockettes. But I was such a contemporary baby. I just loved contemporary movement and that form of dance. And so I knew I always wanted to do that first. And it was always kind of in the back of my mind, like, maybe one day I would, you know, just try and be a Rocket and see what happened. And yeah. now it's blossomed into this beautiful career. Um, that's brought me so many incredible experiences. So very grateful. That's amazing. You are such actually, as soon as you said you're a contemporary dancer, I, I started thinking back on just remembering watching you dance and stuff. I'm like, oh, that's right. Because you were so you're so good at that kind of movement. In fact, you I think you assisted a lot of a lot of the of like big time, like you assisted, I think Mia, right? On so you think you can dance. I mean, you've done a lot of stuff with that type of genre. And sometimes that could be very like free flowy. Right. And that's such I'm, a I'm big... amazed by that because I was just like, OK, you've got to come from a ballet background and you're, you know, because it's so precise. So yes. precise. Yeah. How how did you make that transition from that free movement to don't you dare put your toe past that line? <laughs> It was, it was definitely an interesting transition. So just for like a little backstory, um, I went to school for dance at Chapman University. I met Gev during some So You Think You Can Dance experiences. And yes, during that, I assisted both Mandy Moore and Mia Michaels on the show. Wow. Very contemporary and, you know, just the most fun and such incredible experiences all around. And then I went on to do a contemporary dance company based out of Salt Lake City in Utah, um, it's called Odyssey Dance Theater, and Gavin yeah, and I also Odyssey danced with them together. <laughs> and that was really, I just absolutely loved it. We had such incredible rep and a lot of contemporary, but we were also doing company classes every day with ballet and jazz in the mornings. And, um, you know, I was dancing a little bit in heels, but not, a, not often. I was mostly barefoot. So I um, actually grew up training at a competition studio. So I was trained in a lot of different varieties of dance. And I really started in tap. Um, that was Yay. my first love was Yay. being a tap dancer. Yeah. So when I was young, that was just always my favorite. And um, so going into the Rockhead audition, I really had no idea what to expect. I had seen one show with my mom when I was in high school. She brought me for my birthday and I saw these incredible women on stage that just were so elegant and classy and timeless. And I loved the precision of the movement, the musicality. And I just saw these women that were embodying such like beautiful strength and power on the stage. And that was really, I would say the time when I was like, oh, I think I want to do this. I really want to do this in my career. And so it came the time when I had booked a flight to New York just for an open call. Wow. And I went into the audition and I was, I mean, I think my eyes like popped out of my head because it was just a room full of women in tan tights and leotards and leducas. And I was like, so unaware of what I was getting myself into. I remember the energy of people like practicing moves in the corner. And I was like, did I miss, like, did I miss a homework assignment? Why do people know what they're doing? You know, I'm like, I got my tap shoes. I guess I'm going to just like show up and dance. And I'm sure I would actually pay a lot of money to see my audition because I think I was probably a little bit of a disaster, but I just went in there with no expectations. I was really like, just so excited to be in Radio City. And so when I was take, doing that audition, I remember just being like, I'm just going to dance and like do as much as I can. But the specifics of it are so incredibly exact that I just remember trying to to do what they were telling me to the best of my ability, but to have fun. 
And yeah. I did end up booking it um, that first year, which was pretty incredible. Wow. I was totally yeah. shocked and Amazing. came into this whole new world of precision and exactness when I was just like ready to flow around the space. So um, no freedom, no freedom, yeah. no freedom. But I think that was one of the things that I really loved instantly about, um, uh, about Rockettes was physically and emotionally and mentally. It was one of the hardest jobs I've ever approached because it was just such a huge learning curve. Your first year. I mean, if you have ask any Rockette, their first year is like, I felt like I was studying for a finals exam that was going on tomorrow. You know, it was just like, it's so much information and it's not only just dancing, which we've trained our whole life to do, but it's learning this new vocabulary and this new language and this new way to work in a room and this new environment. And, and I just loved that challenge. I loved that thrill. And then physically you're in rehearsals Monday through Saturdays from 10 AM to 5 PM and making your body do and asking it to do these things that are all very challenging. And I just thrived in that environment and knew instantly that I found something that I truly loved. So I felt really, really lucky and just always worked my hardest every day to, to try and, to try and do the right moves (laughs) and be precise. Question on that. When, when you got the job, I mean, obviously there's a, there's a height requirement for rock heads. I'm sure right along with the height, height requirement, there's a, a lot of other requirements that go on there too. Is that something that's talked about as soon as you do get booked and you get this job? What, what happens kind of next with that? So the outline of the audition is you must be between five, six and five, 10 and a half to audition. Um, it also is obviously they're looking for a type. So just like any audition, even in LA, you, there's typically a type casting that kind of occurs it's usually done within like a technical um portion at the very beginning of the audition where they have you do like pirouettes and kicks just to be like this is like you need to be able to execute this kind of movement in this way to move forward kind of thing so um once you are booked to kind of keep everyone in the same realm and actually it's really done mostly on a like for a health perspective with weight, there's no actual like weight requirement. Um, But we have an incredible, incredible athletic training department that was actually started by a past Rockette. And she, yes, it's, it's, I credit our athletic training department for keeping us all healthy throughout the season and keeping the most number of girls on stage as possible throughout illness, injury, anything, anything we have any issues with, we have a team that is behind us, which is incredible. And so at the very beginning of your first season, you do weigh in, which is a very normal experience. You go in and they, they base based on your height and your weight, you and your BMI, they give you a weight range is what happens. And it's typically a 12 pound range, which if you think about your own body and as a dancer, 12 pounds is like, that's a lot. And so there's this kind of 12 pound range that not only is there for us to stay healthy in the off season and just be like, oh, like we need to be, you know, physically because the show is so challenging, you physically have to be in a certain place where you can get through 90 minutes of solid dancing four times up to four times a day. Wow. Um, But also on the other end, because you're doing 90 minutes of dancing four times a day, you want to make sure that you're feeding yourself properly and your body properly. So you don't go under that bottom number. So you're really healthy and truly, because it is like, it's just such a demanding job and you have to be at your peak physical performance to be able to, to accomplish it. Now, are they talking to you about nutritional end of things? Because you know, in the dance world that that was, that's never (laughs) talked about. (laughs) It's like, go lose 10 pounds and I don't care how you do it. Just go do it. You know, I mean, yes, we are getting better at it, but Mm -hmm. do you have that support system where they actually say, Hey, you know, we need a healthy gut. We need to, you know, have a good nutritional background. Are they there for you for that? Absolutely. And I, that goes back onto the athletic training side. Um, and it's really developed over the years and it's been a really fun process being a rocket for nine seasons. I've watched some of that development occur. And, um, 
you know, right at the beginning of the season, even my very first year, I got a pamphlet that was two weeks before our very first day of, of rehearsals of all of these exercises, like what muscles I needed to strengthen, what I should be feeding myself, healthy fat list of foods of healthy fats, a high energy, like when I have a big day, I know it's really, and, and like you said, in the dance world, that's not very normal. At all. Um, yeah, but it really is within our environment. And a lot of people are actually surprised to hear that because I think Rockettes has a connotation for being like tall, skinny women that there's this like, oh, they must like weigh you in and check your weight and all that kind of stuff. And it's actually much more, like I said before, it's much more from like a overall health perspective and a health standpoint is are, are you good? Is your body going to be there to support you to do up to, I mean, at the peak of our season, you can do up to 17 shows in a week. And so with almost 300 kicks per show and up to, we did do one five show day and that was incredibly challenging, but we have the most in a day is four shows a day. So they, um, have definitely transitioned. And I think with the athletic training department, they really went from being a dancer to really looking at us truly for what we are, which is an athlete and, um, feeding and treating and, uh, you know, giving us the tools that we need, whether it be nutritional advice, which we do have a nutritionist in our athletic training um, team that we can directly, we have access to, you can go to her at any time. Um, but then also on the other end, we, there are ice baths set up for us after every single rehearsal, there are warm, whirlpool, warm whirlpools. That's too hard to say. That is a warm, hard one. <laughs> whirlpools for us before we go on stage to warm up our feet and our hamstrings and our calves. And, um, you know, we can go and tape our feet. We have a full gym upstairs for any kind of warm ups we need with all the machines we could use and, and all of that kind of stuff. And then we also have catering between shows that is filled with, you know, healthy options and things that are going to fuel us for that day. So they've really, um, really taken it on. And in the past, um, you know, well, since I've started, it's just been such an incredible outlet to have, especially as a professional performer when that's so rare. Oh, very rare. Yeah. How about your earlier career as a dancer? That had to be like, I mean, most dancers are not the nutritional base dancer as they should be. Or some are getting there, but I mean, it just wasn't. But back in the day, it's just not. How was that as a transition for you? Or were you always that way? I was definitely not always that way. <laughs> um, I grew up really, really lanky and like just a twiglet. Like I just sprouted when I was like, li- kind of like 16, I just sprouted and I couldn't keep anything on me. Like I just was a bag of bones. So my mom like reassured me that I was, you know, I was like totally fine. But I also in that statement, like I could eat whatever I wanted. And I had no sense of fueling my body properly for my dancing. Like I was a teenager. I liked like chocolate chip cookies for breakfast. I was terrible. Like looking back, it was really crazy. And then I went off to college and I certainly didn't like change at all. Cause then I really had no boundaries. And I always kind of naturally was just a like lean person and that started to change. And I definitely started to notice, you know, weight gain and that my performance dancing wasn't as strong as I wanted it to be. And I'd look around and see other people that I felt like were so, you know, like just, they had this like muscle tone and this structure that I wasn't getting with my body as much as I was dancing. And I was only like, singularly focused on my training and trying to improve my strength, but I wasn't focusing on the other half. And I noticed I, it actually started, I would say my like interest in nutrition and what I was really doing and what I was eating really started actually when I was in the Odyssey dance theater in that company. Um, I just went in and I had like really, really high cholesterol. And I was getting on this medication and my doctor said, you just have, you need to control this. Like, and I just remember being so 
shocked because here I am. I was 25 and I had super high cholesterol levels. And he basically said, I think one of the fastest ways you can do that is to cut out red meat. And so then I started thinking about like, gosh, I'm a professional dancer and I'm not healthy. Like, how is that possible? And I just really dove into what I was putting in my body every single day. And the quality of the ingredients then came later and the quality of what I was feeding myself. And I just got so excited and I, I started learning and just reading and taking in as much information as I could. And then that led me down the path of just wanting to know more. And so I looked into a couple of schools. I ended up at the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, studying their health coaching, health coaching program. Um, one of the kind of staples that they do is they teach you about all different kinds of fad dieting and what each of these fad diets that you've seen, what they really are and kind of what they're doing to your body. And I just, I feel like I got this whole education about so many different options and truly finding what works for you individually within the realm of knowing that you just need to feed yourself high quality, good ingredients on the regular. Yes. And of course, with our mentality, I think something with dancers too is we typically are pretty, I mean, especially in, in Rockette world, we're very, very type A, typically very organized, like incredibly perfectionistic <laughs> type right. people. And I mean, over my journey, I feel like I'm now, you know, in this, at this point in my life, I'm 35 years old. I feel like I don't think about my nutrition and my health anymore because it's become just such a normal part of my daily decisions. But now actually talking about it and thinking back about on that journey, it is really interesting to see how I ended up where now I don't think about what I had for breakfast because I know I've already made the choices typically that they're going to be great. And of course, going and getting any, like, I don't have, I'm not a very restrictive human. I, it doesn't work well for me. So it's just, you know, everything in moderation and what works for you on the daily basis for me is what yeah. I've kind of found. Well, we did, um, um, works. We, did, we did an earlier podcast just, you know, basically on, on a little bit on nutrition. It was kind of, you know, Gavin and I sat down and I said, it is a change and it is, it is hard at first. It's mm-hmm. so easy to go to a pantry and just get whatever junk out of there and shove it in your mouth. It's hard to go to the grocery store. It's hard to have fresh food and, and fruit and vegetables and, and stuff in your refrigerator all the time when that's just not the norm of what you're used to. Mm-hmm. But when you do get used to it and when that is your norm, like you look at that other world and go, how was I ever there? Like, how was I ever there? Back to that just a tiny bit though. How do you, how did that transition with you on your energy level when you started dancing on your muscle mass, when you start, like how long did it kind of take for you to see those kind of fantastic results start happening for you? By the way, I haven't seen Lisa be this excited. (laughs) ever <laughs> like I'm, I'm watching her face while you like, like when you life. get it when you get it and that's what it's the hardest like my husband says he goes Lisa the hardest thing that you're ever going to have to do is try to get people as excited about it as you are and I said yes but if they were ever sick because I I wasn't good you know and I mean you weren't good if you've got yeah. to go on a statin and when you're you know 25 years old that ain't good you know right. so you were at a point where you ain't good, but there's so many people that are there that, that aren't good and just food can change their world and they don't get excited about it. And I just, right. like, God, I get so discouraged. So tell me back to the question, shut up, Gev. Okay. So I'm happy. <laughs> I, love I would it. say, I think that the initial change was actually very fast because I am an extremist person and I, I have that like, once I started to learn, I was, uh, that I'm an overnight, like the next day, that's not going to be what I'm going to put in my mouth then kind of like I was quick. So that was definitely very fast. I also then though, 
because of that extreme, I went straight to being vegetarian. So the doctor said, don't eat red meat. And I was like, all meat's gone. I'm, gone, gone. Never again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm aggressive. You know, I like really get jazzed and like hype about things. So I was a hundred percent in and that extreme actually took me to a place where, yes, I definitely like lost the extra kind of fluff that had been floating around. Yeah. But then I, I was not able to keep muscle on because my yeah. personal body type I have a very hard time building muscle because I'm just like lanky and lean. And that was always the aesthetic I looked at and I wanted, I wanted this like strong yeah, kind of, you know, like strong ballerina, like body. Oh, like yeah. that's the, no, I like good arms. I'm the same way. I, I yeah, And I want to be cut and I want to yeah. see definition. Like I don't want to <laughs> be a twiglet and I right. just was nothing again. And then I started to slowly reintroduce things that worked for me and started to eat more fish and more chicken. And again, I think in anything, I think it's finding what works for you. Like my, I don't necessarily need a ton of meat in my diet, but that's me. Like I know my husband could never, <laughs> he needs it like for his energy yeah. level. And, and yeah, and I think that was part of it too, was noticing energy levels and like timing when I'm listening to my body and getting, you know, taking advice from someone on, oh, you should eat at 8 a.m., 12, whatever. Like I was on this thing where I was supposed to be eating three hours every three hours. And I was like, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm not, that doesn't work for me. You know what yeah. I like? A kind of light breakfast, I like a big old lunch. And like that one Geico commercial that always makes me giggle. I like, I can have a snack for dinner. Like that's, <laughs> that's how I function. That's so us. That's, yeah. 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 And that's like, I know that's how I work, but I know some, for somebody else, it's just like, and I think that's the path of it all too, really is just like, it's definitely a journey. It's definitely finding what works for you, what doesn't. And, and also being really forgiving of yourself because for like the type A really strict, like Great. it took me a while, I would say mentally to be, um, just like, you can cheat. You can cheat sometimes. Yeah. yeah. And especially in the beginning when I was younger, I think I was, I was so focused on my career and so overly um, judgmental on myself. And I was really very critical of myself um, that it came down from all sides when, you know, I would, I would be doing, I'd be eating something I knew wasn't good for me. Where like now I don't, I think I'm just at a very like, comfortable place with myself and my life, my relationships and my career. And so I, I don't even really think about it anymore because I'm just like loving life and doing the things. So, um, but I definitely think that is a journey. Do you ever use your health coaching with, with anybody else you ever consult or freelance at all? I have a bit, I mean, it definitely comes into play. Um, I do, I have some students that I work with who are aspiring Rockettes who I can train individually one-on-one. -on -one. And if they have any questions or we're talking about, you know, getting into that shape that they ideally want to be in for something or, or just talking about like how to kind of structure, start, you know, something new, if they want that, I always have that, um, you know, knowledge and, right. and that history to be able to, to go back to and help, help as much as I can with, so. That's when you when you talk about your yeah. students, like you're, you know, you said you're working with a couple of students that are inspiring Rockettes. What type of work do you do on them? So Rockettes in general is just, like I said, it's its own language. So going into an audition, like I said, was it can be kind of um, intimidating because you're hearing these words that you're like, is that even a real world? Like, what are they talking about? You say H-O-H -H, and you're like, huh? I means hand on hip, like they use oh terminology. God. Yeah. They use terminology that you just aren't used to hearing as a dancer. You're used to hearing as a rockette. There's also just like specific pathways of arms that are typical. So it's teaching kind of these foundational um, things that then make it going into the audition, just a little bit more approachable. We also work in Leduca boots, which for a lot of dancers growing up in studios, they don't technically, they don't typically have training in heels. Um, and training in a Leduca boot in that character heel where you are up over a toe is definitely different than care training in just like 
a stiletto. So there's a lot of dynamics. Um, there's, of course, the specifics of not only a bevel, which every rockette knows how to do a pretty fantastic bevel, but also the strut kicks, the eye high kick. Um, and then just like the phrasing of the movement is really specific and unique. So it's just kind of like getting people prepared to, to know how to execute what they're going to be asked to execute in the audition. Wow. Yeah. When we're talking <laughs> precision and I mean, <laughs> I, I understand, well, one of my dancers was in, he was a male dancer, but he was in Radio City actually as a 12 year old and then older in life as an adult, which was pretty cool. But he said, he goes, there's a difference between your toe on the line and the ball of your foot on the line. He goes, the ball went on your line, you got the note. <laughs> and he, oh, goes, yeah. he goes, you just can't even, you, you can't even imagine it. It's so precise, yes. but like, I mean, obviously just training and training and training does that, but are, is there a point where you get comfortable or is there just, there's never comfort? You're always, you're always on the edge and always in that moment of, oh my God, that line, that line. That's amazing. Um, there definitely is the towing the line. If you're not towing it, you can, you can be arching it where the line's in the middle of it or healing it, <laughs> but you better know what it is. <laughs> The, my other favorite one is there's a cheek where your eyes are front or your the, if you're looking on the diagonal that's not a cheek like your eyes are to the front that's a cheek that's my favorite one too but no there's definitely I mean your first couple of years it's just I I like to describe it like a language because it's like learning a foreign language so of course it's you're always kind of thinking and thinking and thinking but now I would say you know almost a decade in, I'm definitely comfortable going into a rehearsal space because my body, I've trained my body and my mind on how to pick up this choreography and execute it consistently and clearly. And, and also I think part of it is just like how you learn choreography. I feel like being a rockette now putting me in other classrooms or other settings, I can take in what someone is doing head to toe, fingertip to toe tip, because that's how we process information. So it's, it's a, it's just a different way of learning and it does become, it definitely becomes more comfortable. Those first couple of years are <laughs> all the notes, like you get all, all the notes I can't even imagine. and I still get all the notes, but you, I think it just becomes more comfortable and more um, normal in your body to, to want to move like that. Can you can you talk about that a little bit in depth as far as like how the rocket training has helped you? Like because because it sounds like it made you into a slightly different dancer or or not, not necessarily a dancer, but how you take uh, material in. And you Absolutely. think it would hinder you instead of making you better because it's so I don't I don't want to say restricted, but it's so precise. Mm -hmm. But you but you're saying totally opposite, which is very cool. Yeah. Um it definitely, because of the movement and the movement quality and the exactness of it, typically any of the movement is going the fastest path to get there. So it's, there's not going to be a lot of rockhead movement where you're taking up a whole bunch of space. Like you're usually going to be like breaking your arm up and down really quick. You also are typically actually quite close to each other in rockhead movement. So like pathways of arms are always so you don't like hit your friend next to you. Um, but that being said, it's, I've gotten stronger on this job because everything is so quick and so exact. You are using every muscle in your body to hit these positions. And then also within the kicks, the kick line itself, you are not touching anyone next to you. So you're responsible. And I think that's one of the most this is one of the most beautiful things about the job is you're responsible for yourself, but you're never alone. You are not the star of the show. You are a part of this entire group where everyone needs to come together and be working together at the same level and be executing everything with the same intention and the same power at the same time, all the time, so we can all succeed. And that's within that kick line. Nobody's touching each other. And we are just jacking our legs up there and doing 
hard, hard work right next to each other, literally less than two feet apart. And we're in it together, executing this together. So that essence of being a team and being one matching and being able to mimic and match has made me a better dancer when I go into another room, whether it be precision movement or straight up contemporary or hip hop, like I'm going to match what that person's doing because that's how I've trained my eye to take in movement. And then also being able to, if they want us to match everyone else in the room, which, you know, then you have the ability to do that. And you're also strong by yourself. Like I always feel confident and strong by myself, but I also know I can be easily put into an environment where I'm dancing with other people and don't, I don't need to stick out and don't need to be the soloist because truthfully in a dance career, like how many times are you really going to be a soloist when you're working, you know, behind an artist or, you know, at an award show or on tour, like you're typically in some type of an ensemble situation where you need to be cohesive and, and work in an environment together as a team. And, um, I just think that's one of the most beautiful and one of the most, like my favorite thing about the show and this career is not only through the Christmas spectacular, but with my, my best friends and these women that I've spent nine years with, um, we've also put up three different shows in the off season where we were a part of, you know, from pre-production to that show being on the stage. And it just creates this family and this environment in the dance industry that, um, sometimes lacks when you're you're kind of gigging you know and it just is this beautiful family that all is striving to be the best every day together that's awesome yeah you're right because a lot of times when especially in in the the work in los angeles you do jobs you do projects and it's project after project project Mm -hmm. and it might be with the same sometimes with the same people here and there but it was different groups different people and you do establish bonds during the process and during the rehearsals and the whatever, performing, shooting, filming. But after that, it's kind of, you know, everybody runs their own separate way and does their own, you know, because you got to keep getting those different gigs, different jobs. So it is kind of cool to be on the project where it is like a family, that, you know, yeah. for me, like being on Odyssey uh, kind of gave me that a little bit for for one season that I did. I was like, oh, this is great because I feel like I'm actually getting to know these uh, like everybody here and, and mm-hmm. starting to make some actually great friendships from that. So that, that is a cool, um, cool way of looking at it. Any tips for dancers to, to get better at mimicking besides like paying attention to details? Cause I think we hear that a lot, like, Ooh, like you have to do just like this, but there's not a lot of like, I don't know, are there techniques? Are there things that you can try to work on to make yourself a better mimicker? mimicker. Definitely. Um, I think, the two biggest factors, um, because I'm still taking class and training and dancing. And what I notice is as a student, when a teacher is, you know, demonstrating, I am staring at them. So the teacher's over there demonstrating and I'm staring at them, figuring it out. And I tend to notice like people are kind of maybe glance over once or, but I'm, studying and you really, really watching. And that's a skill and a tool that I think is really big because as I, I mean, I definitely heard it on convention a lot too, or in classes when I was younger, like you need to stand out, you need to, you know, be, make people notice you and make you like, make it your own. And some, some choreographers and teachers might want you to, elaborate on their movement and make it their own and if they give that freedom by all means if they say you know add your own little spice to this choreography by all means but if that isn't a directive that's given my assumption is they're making up their choreography they want me to do it like them I'm gonna study them know exactly what they're doing and then if they give me that liberty of here's your own eight count, do whatever you want, or hey, make it your own. Maybe I'll change it up, but I'm going to do them first by looking and then also really, really listening. And that's something 
in the Rock Hat world and even in the Rock Hat audition you might see is them giving a specific detail, teaching it one way, and then actively changing it with a quick just, oh, actually that's going to be over here, just to see who's actually listening and who's paying attention. So I think that's, I mean, as a skill of like how to pick up and to mimic, it's really, it sounds kind of basic, but it's really just like keeping your eyes on the choreographer, on the teacher, and then really keeping your ears open. And then of course, it's also just practice makes perfect. Like the more you can get in class, the more you can train that skill and train that muscle to be able to mimic, the better and easier it's going to be for you as you go. When you assisted with Mia and Mandy, how did mm-hmm. you get involved with doing that? How they, how did that come um, I, when I was younger, I did um, a dance convention called LA Dance Force that was out of Edge, the Edge um, dance studio out here in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. And Mandy was on their convention. She was teaching on their convention. And I won this scholarship that year to come out for the summer. And I lived in LA for three months when I was 17 with one of my very best friends from Seattle. And Mandy was our choreographer for that um, experience. So we did a number that was then in the Edge Scholarship Show that summer. The program was called Dance with the Force. And so I met Mandy during that experience and just was absolutely blown away by her as a mentor and as a teacher. And I loved learning and working with her. And I just instantly knew that she was someone I wanted to consistently train with because she pushed me so hard to do things I didn't ever think I could do. She always believed in me and was just a a mentor and is now a very good friend. And I was asked to, she had me assist her for some of the So You Think You Can Dance episodes. And when I was there, I met Mia on the set and she had me come in assist one of the opening numbers as well. And then Mia actually came and did our um, summer show called the New York Spectacular at Radio City. And I was the assistant dance captain for that show as well, which was really fun and kind of an interesting, um, mo- like, <laughs> kind of like sure, mush, yeah. mashup yeah. of my contemporary world with uh, Mia coming in and then her doing a show for Rockettes was a very like full circle moment. So, yeah. um, but I really do love the assistant role. I'm learning that and have known that for a long time that I just, I, my favorite part of um, dancing and, and the career is probably being in the rehearsal space. I just love being in a studio and working together and solving problems and, and figuring stuff out. It's just like what really gets me jazzed. So um, I love being an assistant and I love that, uh, that role. So I feel very grateful to, to have had those experiences and to hopefully, hopefully do more. Do you think that led you into going ahead and being the dance captain for Rockettes? Do you think that helped I, having worked with her before and kind of being that, like I said, Rockettes is like such its own little language that having kind of you know, knowing Mia's experiences and then having that Rockette language too, it was a really nice little pairing. So I definitely think I was, I was suited for the role um, just because I'd worked with her previously as well. And, and it was a really, really fun show. We had uh, an incredible cast and um, yeah, it was, it was really nice. And at a time when Radio City was really um, trying to put up a, a steady summer show, which hopefully will happen it's going to be so nice to have two full-length productions there for, oh, for the year. Yeah. 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 Um, on our first episode, there was this question that we answered, and I kind of want you to try to answer that as oh, well. Because I think it applies oh, no, to you. I think it applies to you much, much better. But <laughs> the question was this: is it better to be a clean dancer with no sauce or a saucy dancer but not clean? Oh. Because you've done really both. Hard. You know what I mean? I feel like you, yeah. you, you're so good at both. And so, yeah. Right, That's but. a really hard one because, see, there's there's positive and negatives about both. <laughs> because I will say, you have to be able to hit a line. That is something you need in your bag. Like, put it in your toolkit. If they do a jazz line, like, you got to do a jazz line. You can't be like a noodle. You know what I mean? So, like, preferably, okay, let me think about this. 
I she think is analyzing if, the crap out of that I know that. because <laughs> if it was a dancer, like if I had a dancer in the room. Oh. <sighs> It's a hard question. <laughs> it's really hard because I'm just trying to think, can I teach the saucy dancer? I knew you were going to say that. I knew you were going to say that. Uh, because I will say what I can't do is like, it's really hard to get something more out of someone, mm -hmm. you know? Totally I'm like, but if that person is wild, because I also, I'm like, I was super wild as a kid and I'm still very wild, but you can like kind of rein in wild. Yeah. You know, you can be like, I appreciate your sauce, but like, you can't, you got to take, you got to do this though. You got to do a line, but you can still like have some sauce. So I think I would take the saucy and then the I try and whip them into shape. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're a saucy you dancer, go on the line. Yeah. yeah. If you're saucy <laughs> and you're listening, learn how to hit a line. Yeah. Learn how to hit a line. Exactly. Now least said so. I love it. I love it. I love it. Oh. So, so yeah. tell us, tell us a little bit about your, your day as a rocket. Like you, you go to rehearsal and what, what does all that entail? What can people okay. expect? That's kind of a two-parter, but I'll try and be brief ish. So day as a rocket in rehearsal is rehearsal starts at 10 AM. Like you're full out with feeling and all your sauce and your clean lines at 10 AM. So you because of that run at 10 of the show oh, wow. so because of the number. you guys get there a lot earlier to warm up and stretch and all oh, that yeah. I feel like that's your responsibility at that point yes so there's for me typically I like to go there's a gym right down the street that I go to to physically warm up on a treadmill do my own stretches get my body ready to physically be full out at 10 a.m it is run by a union. So it's also like you are on for an hour and 20 minutes. You are in the room, like you are working. You get a 10 minute break. You're on for another hour, 20 lunch, like that whole thing. So it's definitely, um, it's strict, but it's also incredibly productive and just like straightforward, come to work, do your job. Mm -hmm. And rehearsals are really, really fun because you're with all of your friends. You're learning Christmas. Like it's, there's a number where we're literally Santa's like the first number I'm a reindeer. Like it's not that serious. So it's super fun. <laughs> and we have a really good time together. It is like this big family. And then that goes on for six weeks. We go into the theater and do tech rehearsals that flips. So then your schedule's from 1 PM to 10 PM. And you're typically just like set, setting and staging and getting all the lighting and everything to the show. Then once we go into show mode, the casts are split. So there's 80 people, 80 Rockettes in a show and it's two casts of 40. So you don't see everybody all the time. You're on this like crossover. Okay. Um, but the show, same thing. You only have to sign in a half an hour before the show, but you need to be there early to physically prepare. And so mm -hmm. I get there, I make my breakfast at the music hall. I go upstairs. I kind of, I'm kind of slow to get going. So I get there with plenty of time, um, make my coffee, do like stretch a little bit, throw my feet in a hot whirlpool, tape my toes. And then you go get ready for the show. Um, depending on your show day, you have from one to four shows. And then you just, you know, typically you might, if it's like mid, if it's like early December, you're probably going to not only have your shows, but you might have rehearsals for extra events. So during November and December, you're also doing potentially the Today Show, Tree Lighting, the Macy's Parade, any appearances on like any of the talk shows or the news shows in New York because Rockettes at Christmas in New York is the most fun and everybody wants to see them. So we How have- How do you pick who gets to do that or who does that? Because um, obviously typically it's not it's a a Yeah, years. typically it's just a cast list. So you'll get requested to do something. Some of them are signups for like the bigger events, the Tree Lighting and Today Show. You sign up if you want to do it. And they make a cast list out of it and you get, um, everybody just gets the list. And then, yeah, you typically have rehearsals or sh a shoot day, you know, for the Today Show, that's an early morning one. You're usually there by like 5 a.m. And then you might have yeah. two or three shows afterwards. So, so yeah. the thing with Radio City is it's a lot in like eight weeks. It's just crazy. You're just surviving by having the most fun in these eight weeks. And it is, you're on just like this crazy high, but you know, there's this like, light at the end of the tunnel where you're not going to be doing it anymore which is like always bittersweet but it makes it so you know you can like get to it you know you know you can get through it right. you can get there but it's it's a pretty exhausting uh 
eight weeks in there, but very fun. <laughs> how's the how's the pay scale for somebody coming in? Um, it's we actually all get paid the same. Okay. So there's no hierarchy if you've been there for 10 years, which oh, I think sure. just also helps with the camaraderie of the line and knowing, agree, you know, yeah. that everyone's doing the same job for the same work and we're all here together. And um, it's definitely a competitive salary. It's very similar to a broad, Broadway ensemble salary. And you're able to live in New York in the best city in the world on it. So it's, it's also nice because it is only a three-ish month contract, but you're also provided with full health benefits for the year, um, a stipend to pay for dance and vocal classes for the rest of the year. Wow. There's continuing education benefits where they pay a portion of um, your education. If you want to, they actually were the ones who paid for my um, in a, my integrative nutrition. So there's a lot of perks to the job. We are owned, we're a corporate company. We're owned by Madison Square Garden. So you also get a 401k and, and all that kind of stuff. So it, it really does. are amazing. You just, yeah, it really benefits alone as a dancer. Up. Huh? I said, just, just having those benefits alone as a dancer, because we don't get any, any of those things unless you are working for, for a job like yeah. that. Yeah, it's so quite that's, rare. That's so horrible. it's, it's a very, um, a very lucky, you know, lucky uh benefit to the job that is yeah. we're all very grateful to have that because it does just set you up to to really lead a, a life in new york and and abroad there are also many women who only fly in for the three months and do a sublet in new york and then might live somewhere else in the off season might be i mean there are women who are like you know accountants or cpas or they teach fitness for seven of the months out of the year and then they come into new york and they do like three That's months awesome. and christmas yeah, and then they'll like yeah. go on vacation for a couple months and then go back to their normal job like it's you know there's a lot of flexibility within it as well because it is that contract is just really usually from like late september to early january yeah what's the average length of a rocket dancer i would say it's actually longer than you would think so I, well, wanna... I don't now knowing everything they do for you I'm like okay they could be 45 and still be doing it it sounds yeah. great you know? yeah. yeah um I'm going on this will be my 10th season and the majority of the women that will most likely be coming back are all we're all up there like I I would say average length years is between I want I don't know eight to 12. That's fantastic. In there. Yeah. So it is really nice too, because there is definitely a, a lot of turn. There's a lot of returners every year. So um, it does well, make it hard to break probably, in, but. And that probably solidifies their whole entire program that this works. This works yeah. if you take care of of your athletes, it yes, works. And, it does. and yeah. kudos to them. Oh my God, that's just amazing. I'm amazed yeah. by that. I am. And they did, um, with the athletic training department in general, they did do a whole bunch of research and of course have all the analytics and the data based on past years when there wasn't an athletic training program and that wasn't provided for the women. And the amount of turnover and the number of injuries and like people who had to come in and replace if somebody was out of the show and, yeah. and all of this, especially for a corporate company, all of this extra cost of like, yeah. of what, you know, never happened. It doesn't happen Maybe as much anymore happens. because yeah. we're taken care of and we have these resources and our bodies are healthier. And if we do get injured, they have even the outside resources to send us to physical therapy, to send us across the street, to get an MRI, to send us yeah. to our orthopedic or our podiatrist, like we ha just have all of these resources that they've really helped um, keep us healthy and keep us there with that longevity. You, you have you have a voice now. You like we um, did a podcast with Elizabeth Parkinson, and she said, <laughs> "No, but yeah, mom's word. You know, you're injured. I ain't telling anybody. Yeah, if I tell somebody, I'm going to be replaced. I'm going to be fired. I'm going to be this. I'm going to be that. So." She said, you know, I wasn't a good advocate for myself. You you hide and and athletes used to do it too, you know, at least that that's changing also. But mm -hmm. to have a voice and to be able to say, hold up, you know, yeah. I, I I can't, I can't, you know, help mm -hmm. me out. I just think that's 
spectacular in so yeah. many ways. It's just, yeah. spectacular. it gives me hope that like maybe other people will catch on, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and stop with the craft services of donuts all over the place. And, you know, the, <laughs> the stuff that we do that we should not be doing to try and get through a 12 hour rehearsal day, you know, so yeah. that, yep. that's, that's so comforting. Oh, I'm so happy for you. I'm so happy. Thank you. <laughs> Natalie, what, what, what is it like to get those type of corrections and notes after shows? Like, you know, just that are so specific and so uh -huh. like, no, your pinky was off there. Like what is, <laughs> what it's like and how do you deal with that sometimes if you're getting um, a lot, of, you know? You know, I think that's one of the things that's made me grow so much as a dancer and a person in this career as well. Because when I came in and I think a lot of dancers generally see notes as being really negative Person. and like you're doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. And really the reality of it and how I now look at any note I'm ever given is I, I don't care what the move is. I don't personally care. I don't have any, like, it, it's my arm and yes, I'm doing like, but it's not a personal accusation against me that like your arm is in the wrong place, you know? And I'm not like, yeah. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll move it. Like, cool. Good. Because yeah. you get, and I think part of that is too, you get so many notes that it's all, and we all know it's just to make everybody better and to make the whole show look better as a whole and there's so many notes after every show and everyone's getting so many notes that it never feels like it's this like negative thing it just feels like okay you were a little fast on that part and you're like okay and even if I'm like I didn't feel fast I'm like I just gotta go slower like you just gotta get it together like <laughs> you can't be fast like <laughs> yeah how do you keep yourself in it after the third show in that day how are you keeping yourself in it without I, uh, I think it's a personal I think it takes like people have different things that they do to um you know make every show exciting and spectacular because of course that first one is always people are jazzed and excited and like you're so in it and of course the third show of the day you're like oh my gosh and especially like the 98th show of the season I'm like if yeah, really. I have to put this reindeer unitard on one more time like I swear but at the end of the day every single time I go down to the stage level at Radio City and you step on the stage you go down on this elevator you know you I always know I have a responsibility to uphold the legacy that women since 1933 have done for us up until this point. And not only am I so incredibly lucky to be there and to be a part of that legacy, but I want it to continue. And I also want every single person that's in Radio City Music Hall, whether their butts in the very first row or if they're in their last row of the third mez in those 6,000 seats, I want them to walk away having a magical experience. And if there's one tired reindeer on that stage, it's not going to be quite as magical. So <laughs> I think it's just as like going into it with that mindset every single time that this is the first time somebody's seeing the show. This is a really big moment that like maybe a whole family is there for the first time, or it's a grandmother bringing their grandchild. And it's been this tradition for 20 years that they've done with their family. And it's, it's such a special show and such a special beautiful environment around Christmas it's always just fun but it also kind of like I said before it also you know it's going to end so yeah. even though you're really tired on that fourth show of the day like I don't know if I'm going to get injured in that show I don't know if that's going to be my last show I don't know if if the next show like you know and especially at the end of that year that last show of the season is always hard because you're just living the dream and want to keep it going. So I think just taking that stage every single time, which is the gratitude of being in that position and being able to uphold that tradition is always what like keeps me going. That's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Any, any like advice that you, that you want to give before, before we wrap it up, if, that you want to give to, oh. to dancers about rocket, it was just about dance in general. And nutrition, what, since your career. I know, I'm so happy. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
I think advice is to, in my career, I've noticed that there's not really a timeline, right? And especially as I'm like in kind of the later aspects of my dancing career, you know, I'm finding that I'm loving different things and I'm exploring different things on this timeline that doesn't seem normal. And I, I kind of love that. So for dancers, don't, I would just say, don't limit yourself to thinking it needs to happen right now. Or like, if I like, gosh, I I have to book this before I'm this age, or I have to do this by this time or putting any unnecessary pressure on your journey and your path and your time. Um, I think also within that, it's making sure that you're working every day, if you have that work ethic and that drive towards something that will sustain you emotionally and physically when the job's there or when it's not. So if you love dance, you need to find the classes that feed your soul and feed who you are as a human, because that's more important than the gig, the thing that might come or go or change, because I do feel like the world of the arts and dance can be very frenetic and chaotic, and it can be really hard to be grounded. And I think having something in your life that feels grounded and secure and solid will only make you more confident and comfortable when you're in a work environment that might be kind of crazy, or you're at an audition and you feel nuts like just having, you know, that consistent, if it's taking class every week or journaling or going to yoga, whatever it is that just really feeds you every day, finding those things that, that, um, can ground you in your career. And then lastly, I would just say, just going for it and being brave enough to try and to continuously try because, within anything and within Rockettes by itself. I have many friends who auditioned for multiple years in a row before they booked the job and who consistently showed up. And I think consistency and finding what you want and consistently working towards that and being the person that's always in the room and being the person that people can count on is incredibly um, commanding in a space. And it's something that people really, really respect. So just never giving up and consistently working for what you want. Love it. Love it. Love Love it. it. Love it. Love it. Thank you, Natalie, so much. You've been, you've been a pleasure. So enlightening. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks for it. Thanks for giving us your time and educating us on, on your journey and everything (laughs) like that. We appreciate you. (laughs) Well, happy to do it. Such a pleasure talking with you guys. You too. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, If you like what you hear, tell your friends. And we can't wait to uh, to do do our next guest. Yeah. Bye, everybody.